to thank George for the opportunity today to um, let me plug the animals a little bit uh, because what we've been hearing today is that a lot of this is grown to feed animals. So, you know, without betting about the bush, dry conditions and what we need to do to keep our animals healthy through dry conditions are probably, you know, a bit of a, what I'm going to be talking about today and I, I'll keep, try and keep it short and sweet and just hit key messages for you guys. Um, the biggest thing is to plan for how you're going to manage your animals through a dry condition as the feed in the paddock decreases, how you're going to supplement them, what are you going to feed them, what rates are you going to feed them at and that's really important because you need to make decisions based on what you can get hold of uh, to feed them and, um, and and based on a whole heap of other other factors now the most important thing with feed is providing enough metabolizable energy in a day for an animal to maintain its body weight and do what it needs to do with respect to production now Having a good handle on how much energy an animal needs and how many megajoules of metabolizable energy that it needs in a day for a particular stage it's at is vital to helping them get through dry times. When you've got plenty of feed in the paddock, they just eat what they need to do what they need to do and we don't think about it often. But when they, when they start to uh, do things like grow a calf inside them or lactate to feed a calf on the ground. They need so much more energy uh, that as humans it's sometimes difficult for us to get our head around how much they actually have to eat to uh, meet those energy needs. So I do autopsies quite a lot and I open up a cow and I look at the rumen and I go holy moly what am I doing here? There is sometimes 200 kilos of feed in that rumen. And now, do we all know what the rumen's doing? Anyone put, want to put their hand up? Have a, have, have a guess? Yes, it's a fermentation tank. And it's full of this most amazing biota of millions and millions of different bacteria and fungi and other little groovers in there that are fairly specific digesters of very specific things going in. So we've got our protein digesters, we've got our starch digesters, we've got all a whole heap of other digesters. So what you need to be mindful of is what you're putting into that rumen and what the digesters are doing in the rumen to be able to handle what you're putting in. So we extrapolate from that, changes need to be made slowly. So if you want to add a grain into the diet, do you fill your lick feeder with barley? and open it right up and let the cattle in? No, okay. Do you transition them over with small amounts every day until you've got that room and transitioned over so that it can um, deal with that new substrate in there? Yeah, right, so having said that, if you're gonna start feeding oats instead of barley or triticale instead of barley, or you're using pellets instead of your grains, or you're even changing your pellets. Everything is slightly different. And those, the biota in the rumen needs to be able to change over in a, in a, a well-managed, maintained way so that your animals don't get sick. So you need to shandy things across. So you can't just stop the barley and start the triticale. You can't just stop one pellet, start a new pellet. Even though the pellets will all give you you know, nice little recipe of, of ME and protein and blah, blah, blah that's in them, they might have used a different grain to give that ME within that pellet. And so if the basic pellet mix is made with a different grain in it, you're basically feeding a different grain. So please be mindful and shandy things over. So what disease am I mainly talking about here? Does anyone know? Acidosis, yep. So. This is the, the main condition that we see with, with grain feeding in ruminants is acidosis and it's where the rumen hasn't been um, transitioned over to the grain and animals, you know, te you know, I see them, they get a gut full of grain quickly and, you know, it basically kills them, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. Uh, it's not fun for anyone really and it's, it can be preventable. You do have issues with shy feeders and, and ones that'll go off their tucker for a few days and come back onto it and they can get acidosis as well. But it's, it's often with how you introduce the grain that will, um, that, that's when you're gonna get problems. And when you change your ration is when you're gonna get problems. Now, 
The other thing to consider is, is how much energy and, and substrates we've got in our pastures. And then making sure that you're matching the metabolizable energy for the ruminants with a certain amount of supplementary feeding with grain or you know whatever you've got or cotton seed if anyone can get it is is also good for doing that now i urge you all to think about rations and ration formulation and how you're going to do that and seek some advice if you're not sure now a plug for our livestock offices here and our livestock um, extension team because they're the ones that can provide you with specific nutritional advice on how to manage stock through these times and when I mean specific advice it, it's about ration formulation and how much you feed and how much an animal needs and all those sorts of things and your vets can help you with that too but the best people are your livestock officers so we've got Sally Belmain over here say hi everyone does everyone know Sal and Claudia Bryant here so big big plug for those guys uh, now moving right along I'm standing in a paddock of what Anyone want to yell at me? Cereal. cereal, yeah, cereal crops. What are cereals low in? Calcium. Thank you, Craig, calcium. So we always need to supplement and uh, add calcium into the diet of ruminants when they're eating cereals, whether they be green growing cereals, cereal hay, or cereal grains. And the recommended rate would be 2% of lime. So you add 2% lime, so a bag of lime to a tonne of grain or feed. So just be mindful of that. So animals with hypocalcemia, they've got low blood levels of calcium uh, and they, look, last drought I basically saw calcium in, in every way that you could see a calcium um, deficiency. So ranged from tiny lambs being mustered in to get vaccinated who would fall over and fit and froth at the mouth and die through to adult ewes and sheep that were just your classic, what you'd think just weak. And they'd flop on the ground and you'd pick them up and they'd try and walk and they'd be staggery, uh, ataxic, falling over and just sort of no energy and, and flopping down. You know, I'd, I'd see animals with humps in their backs. We'd see them walking on tippy toes. Uh, you'd see them with um, breaks in their bones from what would be minor uh, bumps and things like that happening. So if in doubt, if you don't have your calcium out and your animals are grazing cereals, then think calcium probably as, as your first offender for what problems you might be seeing. Ah, lower ear. So the way to provide calcium is you pop it in with your grain or with your ration at 2%, or you can put out licks. The simplest way is lime and salt 50-50 out in the paddock and let your animals have a feed your own adventure and they can pick and choose whether they want it or whether they don't at that time. And more specific advice on licks and lick blocks can be obtained from our livestock team or, or other sources of information. The other thing that we need to do to keep our animals healthy is to vaccinate them and make sure the vaccines are up to date. So just last week, I saw a lamb with tetanus. Now I rarely see animals with tetanus because most people use a five in one, but this producer uh, had decided that they didn't really believe in vaccinations uh, and they lost about three of their lambs. Now it's, it's not nice at all. So this was a, a white, um, an Aussie white, that was it. And the poor little thing, it was still standing upright and the first thing I noticed was that its ears were really perked up and it was quite surprised. I thought, oh, you're surprised to see me, like its eyes were really wide with its ears pricked up. And then I noticed it was kind of tottering on tippy toes and then it fell over and it had extensor, extensor rigidity. So its legs were straight out in a sawhorse sort of position. And what you can't do is open their mouth because they get locked jaw and the whole expression on their face is all about the muscles on their skull contracting and elevating their ears and opening their eyes. And, uh, and it's not a very nice condition. So we euthanized that one, but I've, I've only seen it twice. So I, I just would put a plug in for vaccinating your animals. The other thing that they can get in drought conditions is pulpy kidney. We usually associate it with um, lush conditions. Uh, however, 
drought conditions, you can also get it. So, so keep your vaccines up to your animals. Uh, and that, um, that's a good thing to do. Now, with respect to planning and managing animals and things like weaning uh, and providing enough nutrition for your young stock, maybe it's too late, maybe it's not, but consider early weaning because you reduce the, the energy requirements of a unit of a cow and calf or a lamb and you are much greater than if you split them up. And so provide um, appropriate rations for the little ones and even think about creep feeding to get them onto their rations early. I know Sal's given talks about that in the past and, and our livestock team can um, give you lots of information about that. Uh, so back to our low energy thing. Pregnant animals with not enough metabolizable energy will get pregnancy toxemia. They basically become recumbent on the ground and they're blind. It's very difficult to save them, so they usually require euthanasia. Uh, and often your sheep will have twin lambs in them uh, and the cattle are um, not, they don't, we don't often see twin calves, but if they don't have enough energy in late pregnancy, they will get pregnancy toxemia. Uh, and then obviously the weight loss and malnutrition kind of side of things of not enough energy to do what they need to do. And a little plug, uh, final thing which came to mind, two things. So Suze was talking about brassicas. I have seen issues with grazing brassicas in livestock, mainly when they're on, um, actually I should say only, on pure stands of brassicas. So polyoencephalomalacia, which is a brain condition that causes them to be blind, they froth at the mouth. They really can't function. They become very dopey. So your steers that are normally running away from you will just be like pet show steers. You know, you walk up to them and pat them and they're just standing there going, ah, oh, human, hmm, okay, I'm just gonna stand here. Instead of, crikey, human, run away. So, you know, lot, major behavioral changes. Sheep, you'll see them sort of falling over. They'll extend their head, stare at the sky, you know, do um, strange things. And they can be fixed if you get them early enough with vitamin B1 injections, which is quickly metabolized. So they need a course of it over a number of days. So I've seen that with um, grazing of brassicas and also photosensitivity in sheep where their heads swell up and their ears swell up and they look a bit sort of strange because you've got these sheep with these massive heads. Uh, so those two things I've seen. And another cautionary tale, if you're going to feed hay uh, from sources such as millet or your sorghums, it can be high in nitrates. So uh, particularly if it was hay that was made with the breaking of the 2017 to 2020 drought. I mean, that's a long time to have had that drought, wasn't it? Uh, and so the nitrogen really accumulated in the plants that we saw with the rainfall following that. And some of that hay might still be out there. And millet uh, and your sorghum species are particularly good. They love a bit of nitrogen. They love accumulating it. And the nitrogen that is in this green plant that I've just picked there will stay the same when it gets turned into hay. So it won't diminish in, in hay. And there are very simple, easy tests to do to see if you've got nitrate um, present in the hay. Uh, you can talk to me about it later if you're interested, but I'd um, recommend you all, if you're feeding hay, to probably you know test it. Either get tests done through um, a, a feed lab or, um, or buy a little bottle of, um, of sticks which when you put it into uh, water that's been added to the hay it'll glow purple if there's nitrate there and so you can work out whether it's dangerous or not to feed. So one of the most horrifying things from uh, the drought, one of the big lessons was people feeding nitrate hay and I saw most of my mass mortality events and by that I mean walking onto a farm and there's 12 dead or 10 or 20 dead animals all kind of lying across the paddock and it'll come back down to the hay that they'd consumed, which was nitrate affected. Yeah, so I think that's probably all I'm going to tell you about today, enough to take in. So big messages, slow transitions of feed, 
slowly if you you know changing changing on to different diets transition livestock over slowly because the rumen is a massive great big um, organ that's full of live organisms and they like the same thing every day and they like slow transitions uh, keep up your vaccinations have your plans in place add your calcium and you should be right oh and remember that there's help around for you if you find things that are are troubling you and we're all at the end of the phone to give advice but we'll do property visits and come and talk to you about you know what you're doing and what you're worried about or if you end up with sick animals there's help at hand uh, to you know you can tap into to get things done so thanks George any questions thanks Heidi um, yeah look really um, really pertinent stuff and yeah really appreciate um, a reminder on some of those some of those things that we may that we may forget from season to season. So yeah, really. Um, are there any questions or any um, concerns that you want to just quickly raise with Heidi with a minute or so? Thanks, Lou. The, the testing sticks, the nitrate. Where do you get those? Oh, they're called. Um, if you Google Quantifix, Q U A N T O F I X. Uh, nitrate sticks. Now what I find with those, and particularly with hay, you have to add a bit of water. And so you put, well, I've got a wonderful friend who's a nutritionist and he talks about a bee's dick of this and then shit loads of that. So you just need, you need a bee's dick of water to go in with your hay and squish it so that you get, let the nitrate, nitrate some very, well, what's the word when it goes? Soluble. Thank you, John. Soluble. So nitrate soluble in water. So you, and then you dip your stick. Now, they say they can be quali quantitative, but they're basically qualitative because you don't know how much water you've got in. So if you then get any um, indication, it'll go like a light mauve through to a bright purple. If you get any indication on your stick, I would then strongly recommend that that sample goes to a feed lab for a quantitative nitrate test. And they will look at what you then get exact figures back with recommendations on what percentage you can feed it in your diet. So. If it's really high, it might only be able to go into a, a TMR through a, um, a mix all at 5% or something versus, you know, whether it's safe to feed. Yeah. Todd. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. So I've, oh, sorry, Claudia. Yes, so prussic acid. I have never diagnosed a case of prussic acid poisoning, although we have seen in the district, I know, chronic uh, neurological conditions in sheep that have been grazing sorghums for, I suppose, a month or more, where they fall over and turn circles on the ground, roll over and over. So if you end up with neurological conditions in your animals, it's always worth investigating. Absolutely, and thank you for that, Claudia. Um, now back to the nitrates, Todd. The times when I saw nitrate toxicity uh, were little things where people were tired and their management maybe, you know, fell over. So one property where I saw 10 dead uh, Angus cows, he would usually put out his cereal hay first for his cows, they're all in a drought lot. And then he'd hop on his tractor and he'd trundle back and maybe have a cup of tea and do a few bibs and bobs and do some other stuff. And then he'd go and get his millet hay and he'd put his millet hay out uh, and then they'd get their millet hay. So their rumens were fairly full of cereal hay first. And when, he, when they were poisoned, what he did was he, on that day, fed his millet hay first. So they were empty from whatever time and he popped his millet hay out and they got that before the cereal hay and that was enough. Uh, so, and the other, another time I've seen it was, um, uh, it's always worse with heavily pregnant cows. So cows getting a ration of cotton seed one day, millet hay the next, cotton seed, millet hay, and, uh, and they changed. They were feeding a batch of millet hay to their yearling steers and they were all coping very well on it because those animals uh, cope better than pregnant cows with nitrate toxicity. And then, so they thought that hay was safe. So they fed it to the cows. They fed it out in the evening, got up the next morning, they were, 10 dead so it's um it's often just those things that trip you up when uh, when you're under pressure and you're stressed and 
and everything seems is seemingly against you that you know I suppose it's terrible to say but stuff just happens nobody's fault necessarily but yeah so just watch it but yeah absolutely a rumen can can adapt to a whole lot of stuff as long as it's given the time to adapt was that too much information <laughs> No, no, that's, that's good, Heidi. And look, um, just extending on from that, so um, through local land services, just for your, you know, for your advice, and particularly if you are an advisor, we do have, um, we've implemented the, the subsidised um, feed quality tests, again, that we did have. Fabulous. Running, that we did have running in the drought last time. So if you've got anyone in doubt, anyone, um, certainly then refer them to one of the live, one, one of our officers, so Warrioda, Moree, so forth, have got the feed quality uh, testing bags um, so yeah so certainly send them send them our way um, as um, Heidi's mentioned we do recommend that thoracic and nitrate um, testing however that is um, we do require the landholder to pay for that but it is certainly worth considering and there are the two rates of whether it's present absent or whether there are levels so you can um, get that and we use the, the feed central at Toowoomba which is quite good but there are look other labs so Certainly, um, yeah, happy whichever lab you want to go. Um, and the other thing is the subsidised water testing. So as, uh, as things get a little bit drier, we have got that um, in offer again through East West. So if people are using alternate water sources and just want to be confirmed about the quality, um, that's on offer as well. So just to, to contact LLS or go to one of the um, offices in the region.